Alrighty. So I see a few folks out there. It seems like the system's working a little bit better today. Um, anyway, tonight we're going to talk about uh, planning tax strategy. Um, a lot of this, um, it's going to be kind of the subject of, of a lot of issues in the course because there's a lot of things you do in retirement and insurance and, and other aspects of personal finance that you're always looking at the, the tax implications of whatever you do. And there really is some planning aspects to it, really are some planning aspects to it, rather than just at the end of the year, uh, you know, figure out how much you owe and have it be a, a huge mystery. It's, a lot of that's completely under your control. Um, these are your objectives, importance of taxes, how to calculate things. Federal tax uh, income return, which, you know, this is the greatest deal being obviously in Alaska. For some of you who have lifelong residents, you, you may not appreciate, but, but some folks, particularly California, New York, other folks are paying huge state income tax. Plus, they're paying sales tax and other things on top of it. And then appropriate tra tax strategies for different uh, financial positions. All right. So, um, the importance of taxes, the problem is, uh, not a problem, I mean taxes are necessary because they have to fund a lot of things, infrastructure, schools, stuff like that. But um, there's plenty of taxes you're already paying. If you look at oh, sales tax that people pay, um, not so much here, uh, except in the Valley. Fees you pay, um, corporate income taxes, or not corporate, corporate taxes that are paid that drive up the cost of goods. So, yeah, you aren't directly paying the taxes, but the uh, price you pay for things are, are, you could say, inflated by, by the amount of tax that the corporations are paying, companies are paying, and then your own income taxes. So we're going to talk primarily tonight about just income taxes. Um, importance of taxes, effective tax strategy, understanding tax rules. The tax rules, I mean, very few people can put their, their arms around the whole process. It's incredibly uh, complex, but the good news is is that the software industry has come up with, with programs. Now, I'm not advocating for any particular software. In fact, you may, you know, end up using, doing it yourself by hand. You, that's still an option. Or uh, you can hire somebody to do it, or you can use some software. But what I would advocate, at least for, for planning use, is um, some of the software just to, to do your planning. You don't ha actually have to file with them. There's no commitment or anything like that. So um, you might shop around because there's different, different folks who offer it. TurboTax, obviously a big one. But there's, there's other tax cut. There's, you, you can go in the software section and see a number of, of uh, people who do it. But most people don't even you know, actually get the software. They just do it online. So what I've done for tonight is um, to, to kind of make things a little bit more concrete for you, um, decided to look at some tax implications through TurboTax rather than say, hey, if you buy a house, it will favor you in taxes. Well, we, we can just run some artificial numbers um, through any one of these software things. And, and the reason why I've got this page is, yeah, if you do have to buy them, obviously they're, they're well, any one of them is under 100 bucks. But the other thing is that you don't pay until you actually file. So don't worry about it. I mean, you can compare, you can run numbers, you can, you can see the implications of, of some action you're thinking about taking without um, committing, certainly without paying. The other thing, too, is if you're just exploring taxes, uh, for tonight's example, I just use bogus numbers. Um, you know, most of us have a sort of a secondary email account, one that you don't mind getting filled up with spam. So um, certainly when one of these people wants your email address, unless you want to get bombarded with stuff, um, give them a, a not your primary email address. And certainly, unless it's the company you're actually going to file with, uh, they don't have any business needing your actual Social Security number. But the numbers, the name, you know, I used initials. I didn't use names. I didn't use real data other than um, trying to plug in some some financial data, just uh, sample kind of data. We'll take a look at that. Um, so let's step through it. So like I say, you can just go online, look up any sort of tax software, but 
TurboTax will give you pretty good answers. And like I say, they most of them have this policy where you aren't paying anything. So I figured in some just notional numbers, which might or might not apply to you. So again, when you're doing the, the you know, experimentation on your own, put in some numbers that are fairly realistic to your situation. This one, the guy's making like about 100000 altogether, but he's part of it is being um, probably in some sort of tax deferred savings, which we'll talk about later. So he's actually showing an income of 91.5 on his uh, wages. Already paid in taxes, already withheld, that WH, is 18300 So, you know, th this whole notion of getting a refund at the end of the year, if you're getting a refund, it's because you withheld too much. It's not, you're not getting a gift from the government in, in most cases, unless you're a uh, low earner. But in the situation most of you will be in, um, you know, that's your money. You've kind of given it to them as a prepayment. And if they give you a bunch of money back, guess what? You gave them a free loan and, and uh, you should change things next year. And you can manipulate that by changing your deductions and, and doing other things. And uh, anyway, getting that to, to a number. Now, again, you can't have it as zero. They, they do need to withhold something. And if you aren't pretty close, um, there's actually penalties that are incurred. So, but if you get within, say you pay 90% uh, of, of your estimate, then there are no penalties. So anyway, the Social Security wages, like I say, were a little bit higher, so obviously there's some sort of tax deferring going on in there. And le a lot of the other things are just kind of left blank because they aren't really going to change the example in, uh, in this case. So we use those sorts of numbers, and what I did here was, based on those numbers and, and not a whole lot of other deductions, this person at that rate and paying 20000 bucks, which isn't that hard to do, because when you first buy a home, guess what? You buy, a say, a $350,000 home, uh, your payments and all that. Um, payments on the way loans are structured, especially, well, at least here in the States. In Europe, it's a little bit different. But in the States, your, your uh, mortgage payment is almost all interest at first. Towards the end of the loan, uh, it's a different proportion. But in this case, saying you paid 20000 you know, again, I'm using round numbers, but you paid $20,000 over the course of a year to, you know, big bank in this case. Um, what that did was it generated um, a refund of sixty two thirty nine. So you had some refund and having 20000 bucks in interest payments added to that. So let's go to the next slide because all I've done here is I've showed you're basically a renter and you pay no interest. You know, your landlord, yeah, he got an interest break, but you can see what happened to your refund. You went from 6,300 down to 18. So, you know, it's, it's not a one for one, it's a deduction, it's not a credit. But just the same, that's, you know, five, nearly five grand you, you left on the table. You gave up by being a, a renter. So that's just one way. The other thing, um, also included when you're when you're a homeowner, and we're back up to sixty three, or sixty three hundred bucks, sixty two hundred bucks, because I I put that twenty thousand dollars back in there for the uh, for the uh, interest payments, and I'm saying you're paying um, thirty six hundred a, a year in property taxes. So that's like three hundred bucks a month, which in the municipality of Anchorage that's maybe pretty close. So anyway. Um, again, since you paid that thirty-six hundred, uh, this is your refund, the, the sixty-two something. And again, if you are a renter, um, you lost about nine hundred bucks. Now, granted, you didn't pay that money in, in taxes, but the thing is that you get credit for for taxes paid. The same would be true if you're paying state income taxes, which we don't here, hopefully won't. But anyway. Um, it's a it's a complex system and trying to come up with these the numbers for your particular situation what you're best doing and this will be a project later on is to sort of run the sample numbers what I'm saying about this though is is uh, my point is that you can run these numbers now before the end of the tax year if you wait till after the first of the year outside of a, an IRA that you can kind of recategorize but um, saying you pay interest in this previous tax year, once this year is done and you get around to filing, it's too late to, to make adjustments. So um, that's why it's important before 
uh, the end of, of the year to kind of have an idea uh, of what, what you're going to be paying in taxes. So if there is some uh, changes that can be made on your part, and you may want to run it by an accountant to, to double check, but you'll have a pretty good idea just by uh, running a sample uh, version through, through TurboTax. So that's just something to, uh, to think about because I know a lot of times when we get into the slides, it, it seems like abstract details and they're, they're saying this is a good deal, this is a bad deal. When you can plug in your own numbers um, and, and see exactly how it affects you, um, you know, it's, it may, may influence your decision. So back to the, uh, the financial planning business. Um, know the current tax laws. You know, unless you're a CPA, uh, that's going to be pretty challenging if we're talking on a personal level. If you do this as a business, yeah, that is your job. But for, you know, personal finance, your own type stuff, or, well, anyway, it's, it's real tough to get your arms around the whole thing. Um, one caveat to what I said about the software, there may be updates at the end of the year if there is a tax change, but uh, they're usually pretty minor, and th those types of changes are are usually pretty small, but they will release sort of a final version of any sort of tax um, software or updates um, before actual filing time. Anyway, take tax planning, take advantage of the tax benefits while pay, paying your fair share. I have no doubt that just about everybody will pay at least their fair share. So I'm not saying tax evasion, but I'm just saying, you know, if you look at all the hidden taxes you're paying, uh, you know, you have no, no reason to feel guilty. Four types of taxes. Taxes on purchases, so not a hidden tax. In fact, in the states where they do have sales tax, it's, it's added on after the fact. In Europe, they have a value-added tax of like 20%, and it's included in the price, and people don't realize they're paying it. So at least that's one thing they do here that's a little bit more upfront. Taxes on property, real estate, and personal property tax. We don't deal with a personal property tax. Again, it's, it's a state-by-state -state thing, and, and that can be a problem in other states. Taxes on wealth, uh, federal state tax, and state inheritance taxes. Um, I'll talk more about that in some of the retirement issues, but uh, there, there are some exceptions, and, and it's pretty hefty for, for most people's uh, uh, estates. In, in Alaska, uh, not a problem for you. If you move to another state, um, there's actually an article that I can reference in Forbes, and it talks about basically states not to die in is the title of the, uh, the article. And, and if you, you know, happen to pass away in the wrong state or your state is um, distributed in the wrong state, um, yeah, your, your um, beneficiaries, whoever they are, are, are going to be in a, a different situation. Taxes on earning. Earnings, income, and Social Security taxes. Okay, income tax fundamentals. Um, this whole calculating the, the taxable income and the amount owed, you know, there, there are charts, there's marginal income tax brackets and all that, but, and it's important to, to look at those for education's sake, but, but you know, most folks use, use software that have those tables plugged in there. And rather than, you know, spending an inordinate amount of time on doing those sort of calculations, your time's better spent in changing um, the income and the, uh, um, the, the, you know, the deduction side because you have control over that. So if you're going to spend, you know, many hours on your taxes, um, you know, use the software to aid you in the calculation bit and and spend your your real time on figuring out how to pay uh, the least amount of taxes legally. Okay. Taxable income, there's going to be a concept called AGI, adjusted, adjusted Gross Income. So you're going to have a certain amount of income, and based upon deductions, um, that income will come down, and then that will be the income that you'll actually be paying the income tax on. So it'll be lower. There's different ways to do deductions. You can take a standard deduction, or you can itemize. And, and most folks um, in your situation, once you get established, will be itemizing like the rest of us. Let's look at the next slide. Okay, determining adjusted gross income. So you have different types of income. In earned income is just what it sounds like. You know, wages, salaries, 
tips if you happen to be in that sort of business. Investment income, that's strictly from, from stocks and other things. It's, it's uh, you know, a lot of times this is uh, referred to as capital gains or also could be uh, obviously rent from investments. So any kind of investment income, dividends. Passive income, that is, and if you're involved in a passive income situation, that means that you can't be involved in the day-to-day -day management of that. And so it has different tax implications. It's not that common. Um, other income, there are all sorts of things. I mean, if you win the lottery, yeah, they will, they will come find you and you will pay taxes on that. In fact, they'll be a withholding when you get issued your award. Alimony, not that common anymore, but any of this gambling type stuff, even in the casinos, yeah, if, if it's over a certain amount, uh, there's a withholding uh, before you even, well, you don't, you don't get the full amount in the pay of the IRS. Uh, they get their take before, before you get it obviously, because people tend to lose that. Um, tax liabilities, you've got the exclusions. Um, you know, you've got some income which can be tax exempt. Some of these state and municipal or city bonds, as they call them. Um, but uh, as you saw in your homework, you know, uh, tax uh, exempt vehicles generally pay less um, in terms of interest because they can, because they're more attractive to people, because they know that they don't have to offer as high interest rate because people are going to gravitate to them to, to avoid the taxes. So again, it's not as easy as it sounds. I mean, um, yeah, if, if you could get a reasonable return on tax exempt income, that would be great. But if it's just tax exempt and you're still getting eaten away by inflation and everything else, uh, you may not actually have income. You may only be keeping up with it especially when inflation is, you know, 2% a year or so, depending on which calculation you're using. Total income is also affected by tax-deferred income. Tax-deferred income is taxed at a later date. So it's not, it's not tax-free, like when I say, you know, a 401k or, or some of those things where um, your income is going to be reduced by the amount that you invest. At some point, you know, everybody's keeping track of that money and when you take the distribution, when you actually take that money, say when you're 59 and a half or older, um, you're going to pay income tax on it. Now, if you're truly retired and your only income is those distributions, well, the government's cut and because your tax rate is going to be so low, it's going to be low. So that's, that's how it is in concept. These things are a great vehicle. We'll talk more about them in the retirement uh, section. But uh, again, the, the government kind of has their eye on it because they consider that their money and right now um, because of the popularity of those they, they see that they're not getting um, as much of their money as, as they would like so it's a good deal while it lasts um, these are these adjustments to uh, to gross income so contributions to a IRA individual retirement account or KEO a KEO is is used for uh, self-employed people um, also alimony payments if you're paying it out obviously that's going to come off student loan interest tuition and fee deductions, and then tax-deferred retirement plans such as 401k, 403b. Um, any of these things, though, if your income starts to creep up further and further, um, you're no longer eligible for this. You know, my children, I can't deduct them any longer, not because I don't have children anymore, but just because, you know, you, you hit a certain threshold and, and uh, whatever, they, they, they cut off those deductions. So again, that's where the tax software will, you know, be helpful in, because it has all that programmed in there. It knows the rules. It'll ask you a series of questions and do that. Again, I sound like a, a pitch man for this software, but um, especially when, you, when you're looking at the free option, just to compare the answers you're getting either from your own calculations or from uh, somebody you've hired to do your taxes, um, you know, it's, it's always, it's like a doctor just getting a second opinion. Computing taxable income. So you get the tax deduction, there's an amount subtracted from the AGI, the adjusted to gross income. And, uh, you know, now you're going to find out um, where that, that is your income that you're going to use in terms of the tax calculation and, and what to pay. Subtract the standard uh, deduction or itemize. So um, again, most 
folks, they, they give you a, a standard deduction. Let's say it's 7000 8000 whatever the number is. Um, if your deductions are more than that, then you would want to itemize your deductions. So, you know, different things, different investments, but most people will find that they need to itemize at a certain point. Other deductions, and there's a difference between deductions and credits. Deductions are a good deal. Credits are a great deal. Now, credits are not, they don't apply to everything, but, but what a credit means is a credit means a reduction in your taxes directly, whereas a uh, deduction means a deduction off your income and when you go to the tax tables or use the computer say you're in a 28 percent um, tax category it's going to be of, of that amount so let's say uh, you've got a thousand dollars of income if you're in a 28 percent category you're paying 280 bucks if if you've got a deduction well your income would would come down and then the 28 percent would be of that amount. Um, maybe not the best clearest explanation for you but what you're going to get is is you know uh, a smaller um, chunk of that depending on your your actual um, percentage the, the group that you fall in. Credits typically do have a yeah that's one of the questions are you saying a credit has a dollar for dollar value. That's the concept, yeah. Whereas a deduction is not. A deduction comes off your income and then, um, you know, if you reduce your income by say a thousand, then that's that much less your income that's, that's taxed. I'll do a better job of explaining that on, um, uh, I'll probably have to get a uh, actual, you know, math problem to, to show you what, what that's like. But anyway, just keep in, keep in mind that the terms credit and deduction are not not synonymous. They're they're two different things. The credit being far better. Next, subtract exemptions from AGI and exemptions deduction for yourself, your spouse, qualified dependents. The amount of exemption increases each year. After deducting uh, exemptions, you have your taxable income. So, apologize for reading the slides, but that is how it works in terms of uh, figuring that out. Um, calculating taxes owed, marginal tax rates. So this is what we're talking about with this 28% tax bracket. For example, after deductions and exemptions, a person is 28% pays 28% taxes for every dollar. So 28% tax bracket, every dollar over that pushes you to that 28% tax bracket, every dollar over and above there, is, you're going to lose a little more than a, than a quarter of it in taxes. So when you talk about marginal, uh, marginal tax rates, because that's the system we're under, um, it applies to the dollars that exceed that threshold. Average tax rate, um, that's just you know, a calculation sort of after the fact. Um, 30,000 bucks, total tax bill of 3,000, their average tax rate is, is 10, but 10%. But we work under a marginal, or at least you're calculating them under a marginal tax rate. This is just to reiterate what I said before. When you're looking at a tax refund, you know, and you're getting a huge chunk of money back, unless it's some unusual case. But if you're, if you're, you know, think that that the government is, you know, giving you a big chunk of money and and you're making a normal salary and you're having a withholding. Um, you've got a problem. Somebody just asked the question. So if, so if someone falls within a tax bracket, that tax bracket, 28 cents per dollar on a paycheck would be taken out. Um, not necessarily. It's, it's going to be your marginal tax rates. You're looking at the whole aggregate at the end of the year. And you have the different tax brackets. You know, you have a lower tax bracket, say, just looking at numbers, say like 15 percent. So the first, you know, 40,000, 50,000, I apologize, I don't have the table in front of me, but will be taxed at, at um, uh, that 15%. And let's say from whatever I said, from, from 50,000 to um, 80,000 would be at the next rate. And let's say anything above 80,000, let's say you made 96,000 in this case, that sum from 80,000 to 96,000 
would be charged at that 28% rate. So of your paycheck, you wouldn't just say, oh, you know, I'm paying 28% in taxes. That would be an average rate. What we're using is a marginal tax rate. So yeah, if you look at the most confusing situation, you know, obviously that's the one that the tax man uses. And so we use a marginal tax rate. And so it's, it's that dollar over and above um, that next rate. So, you know, if you're only making, say, 40 grand or something, your tax rate is going to be quite low. In fact, you're going to be uh, getting money back for, well, sometimes. But, well, anyway, I don't want to go there. But we aren't going to be down in those rungs. You guys are going to college, so you're going to be, uh, um, you know, making uh, in, in a rate where you're going to be looking for a uh, deduction. And probably going to be homeowners who are going to be itemizing as well. Now, see, here's the tax credit. A tax credit is amount subtracted directly from the amount of taxes owed. So this, you know, one for one thing that somebody asked a question on, a hundred dollar tax credit reduces your taxes by a hundred bucks. A hundred dollar tax deduction um, reduces taxes by twenty eight bucks if you're in the twenty eight percent bracket. So you see the difference there between credit and deduction. Credit is a great thing. If, if you're offered a credit either for, you know, it might be some energy credit, it might be whatever credit, but, but a deduction, you know, you, you certainly want to take all your deductions, but just realize that, that the uh, amount, here's a $100 deduction, and that's more than likely $100 you spent, and uh, you're getting 28 bucks savings. So not one for one. When somebody gives something to charity or something and they say it's tax deductible, it's still, you know, costing them a bit, but they're getting some benefit out of it. Is there a tax credit for higher education? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Um, it depends. Again, no. Um, I was uh, on some of my um, education. I was basically priced out of it um, due to my income. Also, um, it needs to, there's specific... Uh, qualities like higher education is a good good example um, my daughter went to APU last year as a um, high school senior so um, although it was a college it you know considered higher education I didn't get that deduction so. recent tax credits foreign taxes probably not too common for you guys but sometimes you, you're you've got some maybe some goofy investments or something that have foreign investments, you know, get strange forms at the end of the year. I actually pay foreign taxes because I've got a, a house in Germany, so that kind of works. Um, there's, you know, with tax credits and, and different tax things, the government is trying to get you to, you know, exercise certain behavior. So, um, or they're trying to take care of maybe the elderly or the disabled. So, when they talk about tax loopholes, most of the time those things are put in there to encourage some sort of behavior or give, you know, certain people a, a break. I mean, one of the questions on a uh, on on any of the tax forms is, you know, are you blind? Are you disabled? Are you whatever? And there's there's different programs. If, if you answer no, um, that's and you're using computerized software, that's going to be one of those series of questions. But if you answer yes, then then you're going to be in a different situation. Uh, this is the W-2. Again, you get these at the end of the year. Um, sometimes it's kind of tough, you know, but you've, you've got last year's W-2 if things are close. If uh, you can kind of do a, if you're doing estimation type stuff, you can look on your, um, you know, paycheck or your pay stub and usually get year-to-date figures and just do the math and kind of extrapolate those, those out to figure out where you're going to be setting for for that next year if it's your first year on the job if it's you know a continuing job then uh, last year's numbers will, will probably be good enough unless you have some some better information to work on uh, prepare tax yeah the five filing status categories single married filing separately head of households and qualify whatever you know, sometimes these laws, they, they change and manipulate. There, there was a thing called a marriage penalty where, where certain people would basically finance a honeymoon each year. They'd get divorced, do their taxes, 
and then get remarried. I mean, um, I think that's been, well, I know that's been eliminated, but you have to, you know, look for some of these strange situations, but some people will, will go to great lengths to uh, look for strange situations in the tax code and take advantage of them. Obviously, though, uh, uh, the married filing jointly, if, if you have that, if you're in that situation, that's probably going to work out for most of us and certainly head off household single, um, that's going to, well, you're, you're going to jump into those higher uh, marginal tax rates much quicker if you're a single guy. If you got a hundred grand and you're all alone, uh, you're going to get taxed. If you're married with dependents, um, it's not going to be as bad a burden. So that's all factored in there. Again, it's, it's you know, they're trying to make it fair to a certain extent. Um, which tax form should you use? This 1040 easy. You, you may have used these. I mean, you can fill these things out for free. Nobody will even charge even the, uh, the software companies because they figure they'll build you as a customer. Plus, the other thing is they'll save all your data so you don't have to type in your address and your name and your social each year. So um, 1040 easy. It's easy, simple form. Again, my daughter filled that out when, uh, you know, just for a summer job. But less than 100 grand and um, income, uh, wages, salaries, and no more than uh, 1500 of taxable interest. So, anyway, it, it only applies to certain situations. Normally, folks who are, uh, aren't yet in a, in a career. 1040A, again, there are some credits are allowed. You can do the, uh, the child care. So, again, kind of a simplified system. And then um, 1040. And that's the one that most people use. And, and it doesn't hurt, again, to, um, you know, attempt the different forms, find out whether the situations apply, and then use the form that's best suited for you. 1040X to uh, amend a previously filed return, which sometimes you got to do. I mean, things will change. They'll, they'll change your income or they'll realize there's a, a problem. You get a, a tax form middle of the year from your employer. Well, it's incumbent upon you to uh, square that situation uh, in case you ever get audited. So, in summary, tax calculations, uh, filing status, income adjustments, tax computations, and tax credits. Other taxes, payments. Sometimes people, uh, if you're self-employed, you know, it doesn't mean that um, you don't have to pay taxes um, until the very end of the year. Uh, typically, there's quarterly payments to, uh, you know, that are made. Let me see, this one just asks a question. If a married couple has only one spouse working through a full taxable year, should they file together or separately? Um, typically, you would want to file together. Um, but again, what I would do is, because, you know, there's, uh, you've given me some information, but in terms of income, in terms of other things you might qualify for, um, you know, step back and forth through the software. Try it one way and try it another. And then uh, there's also plenty of books on this information. But uh, I could almost certainly tell you that, that you're going to be wanting to uh, file uh, together. But uh, the other thing about this is the books themselves are tax deductible. And the preparation fees, if you're paying an accountant or if you're buying the software, um, you know, the, any of those packages know enough to uh, ask you to uh, Make sure you, you don't miss out on that deduction. Sign your return. Most of the time this is done electronically. At least I haven't filed a, a mailed return in, in some time. So uh, most of the time you can, you can get that done electronically and it's just easier for everybody. Plus the IRS is, you know, it, it leaves you a better record. You get a PDF copy rather than trying to keep track of, of paper and the rest of that. Tax assistance sources, um, you can go to the IRS themselves. You know, they have become a little bit more user friendly, but uh, there's lots of commercial folks like that. Ernst and Young's big, Ernst and Young, big accountants, big eight kind of guys. The internet, uh, the internet, well, that's a, you know, huge trap if, if you aren't smart about it. But if you uh, go to 
one of the reputable slats, somebody that's either uh, traced back to the IRS where you can actually look at the document, but just the internet per se, um, you know, what kind of garbage is out there. But tax preparation software companies, these guys do have a vested interest in trying to make it easier and trying to get you hooked. I mean, it is kind of, you know, it's kind of like the crack of, of software. Once you get your data in there, you come back the next year, you sign in, and it sort of auto-populates, and you're good to go, and then you just change the numbers. But the thing about it is, you know, roughly about this time, uh, maybe another month or two, while you still have time to, to do things, um, you want to look at, at your tax situation. You know, if, if you think you're going to be making a lot more money next year and you've got some, say, some stock or investment or a house or something that's going to be sold that's going to generate some, some you know, a taxable event for you, do you want to do it this year so that you um, minimize your taxes next year? Do you want to spread it out? Um, and, and what sort of tools can you, you can do? But uh, it can, what you don't want is... Uh, to you know, be hit with a surprise, a, a nasty surprise anyway, in in the following April. Electronic filing, like I said, that's kind of the standard, uh, with very few exceptions. Um, you know, it's it's fairly seamless, and there's no checks written. You either get a credit to your account or um, you get a debit from your account. Again, be careful with you know, so many scams out there. There's there's all these tax preparers who offer you an uh, instant refund, well, it's not so much an instant refund. The IRS doesn't work like that. Uh, you know, it's, it's really a loan against your own money, and the interest rate is, is not in your favor. So, um, you know, if you want a quicker refund, file early and do it electronically. But to, to take that money up front, um, check out the situation. I think you'll find out that, that it's nothing more than just a short-term loan with a exorbitant in interest rate. Tax preparation services. I've used accountants before, you know. Um, I was overseas and, and uh, we had some folks, but I didn't interpret things the same way. I mean, you, you can take your paperwork to one accountant and then take it to a separate accountant and you're going to get different numbers. I mean, the problem is you can't afford to, you know, these accountants and, and attorneys, whoever, they're, they're charging a pretty good fee, so uh, you can't really shop amongst them. Also, if one of them's doing unethical, yeah, they're going to sign their name and they're going to be on the hook for a bit of this, but the IRS is going to come to you for the money, and, and if you had knowledge that you were doing something shady, then, then you're, in, you're in trouble too. So um, anyway, and then the old manual method of filling out the paperwork, um, even the IRS has got some simplified, you know, state-run, government-run type uh, systems where you can do the thing electronically because it's just so much easier to, to keep track of. They should tell you how, how long you have to keep the forms because it's typically uh, six, six years. They say sometimes three, but really it's, it's six. And if you make a mistake, it, it is your fault. You know, the fact that I didn't know, that, that doesn't wash with the IRS. Um, you know, the regs are out there, even though they're really complex, um, you're still responsible for it. The chance of getting audited, uh, again, some of these, you know, on uh, TurboTax, the other software packages, it always tells you your risk of being audited is such and such based upon, you know, how uh, dicey your situation looks in terms of your income paid to the amount of taxes you're paying. But even the big scheme, they're only looking at about 1%. I've never been audited. I've had them send paperwork back. In some case, they wanted 50 bucks or something. It was like, that, that was easy money. I don't need to get involved in a, in a hassle with the IRS, and here's 50 bucks, and, you know, everything was, was done. And I still, to this day, oh, I didn't want to ask them, <laughs> you know, what it was about. I didn't want to highlight myself. I, did, I, I never want to meet those folks. And if you can get through life like that, you're, you're doing well. Um, tax avoidance. This is all legitimate stuff, you know, all the stuff about, oh, yeah, this guy's got money stashed in the Cayman Islands, and, hey, if, if that's what works, if, if it's legal, now, if you're going to be doing stuff like that, you definitely want a, you know, attorney or, or an uh, accountant involved in that. But if it's a legal, you know, one man's loophole is another man's deduction, you know. So, again, um, 
anyway, I feel that most of us pay enough taxes. So if if it's tax avoidance, that's that's all fair game. Tax evasion, that's scamming. It's not as prevalent here in the states, but I tell you again, in in Europe, anytime I had anybody come to my house to do anything, their question was always, "Did you need a receipt?" And and that was code language for, um, you know. If, if I don't have to give you a receipt, then this is all under the table. I'll continue to collect my German unemployment, and this money's all cash to me. And, oh, by the way, the income tax rate here is about 40%, so I can do this job for 40% less and, you know, still make money. So, anyway, I never needed a receipt, but that wasn't me being involved. I, I'm just paying the guy, you know, cash. And But I tell you what, those folks were... Anyway, it's pretty rampant over there, and I hear it's even worse in France. Let's see what else we got. So tax evasion, don't want to get involved in that. You don't want to be the guy, you know, working under the table and, and getting caught doing that. But I've got to think that that stuff is going to become more rampant as, as uh, the tax load goes up here. People will, will find ways to work around the system rather than within it. Um, this is some of the stuff we're, we're talking about. Now, again, you know, I kind of fault the book and the fact that, you know, they're kind of saying this after the fact. In order, this is good information, but in order to act upon it, you need to know this before the end of the tax year. So you have to do like a trial run of your taxes. So to minimize taxes owed, you know, you can do all these things, accelerate direct deductions, delay the receipt of income, you know. However your situation, you may have some sort of situation where, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can you can sell something and, and put it in this tax year or next tax year. You have to look at that. And, and in order to do that, you have to have, you know, two bits of information. A, is the tax rate going up next year, just the overall rate? Or is my income going up the next year? We had a bunch of folks when I was, uh, uh, we had a bunch of Navy folks who were separating from the military and they were going to be given a big lump sum cash payout, you know, and it was all going to be taxable. So they asked that it be spread out over three or four years, which was a smart idea because that way, you know, the next year since they're getting checked from the military, their income was going to be down to nothing because most of them were going back to school. And if you spread it out over a few years, they don't end up giving it all back in taxes. Anyway, there's, there's, if, you, if those things are under your control, you, you definitely want to take advantage of it. Homeowners, um, I've already hit on that with that example. Mortgage and property taxes are deductible. There's another section in there where they talk about those things as being credits, but the true term for those is deductible. It reduces your, your taxable income, plus, you know, I think your quality of life is a little bit better if you're actually living in a house, but that's just me. Whatever your situation is, um, somebody's going to be deducting those, that interest, and whether it's you or the landlord is, is the question. The home equity line of credit, like I said, consumer debt, credit card debt is not deductible, but uh, home equity is. Job-related expenses, these have to be unreimbursed, you know. If you had to move for your job, if you, you know, need a computer for your job that they don't give you, um, there's a lot of wiggle room in there, especially if, if you're self-employed, you've got uh, a lot of latitude. Uh, tax exempt investments, municipal bonds. That's good, but I'm just saying that that, you know, it's a competitive world. The peop the reason why people um, offer interest mm -hmm. on investments is to, you know, get people to, to give them their money for investments. And if you've got a, a tax-free product like a municipal bond, well, they don't have to offer you the same interest rate. So, again, it's, I know there's that problem in your homework, and if you look at that, um, you know, it, it sort of shows you uh, you, you have to look at, at um, what that interest rate is compared to a, a taxable investment. Tax exempt investments, again, municipal bonds. Uh, put your money in, in tax deferred. Okay, so tax deferred, again, it's not tax eliminated. You're still going to pay taxes. It's just deferred to a later point in life because most of these are retirement things where. Um, you know, you aren't going to uh, have to pay uh, the same rate. There's other things, too. Uh, you know, f uh, we could spend all night on this, but there's things called 529s and some state uh, tuition-type things that you would probably 
want to set up for your kids. What happens there is you invest the money and uh, the earnings on that are not taxable. So if you invest some stock and you know the stock doubles, triples, um, that um, capital gain is, is not taxable. So check into that, but they're offered by number of companies and, and there's a lot of flexibility. My daughter's is actually in uh, the state of Texas. I don't live in Texas, she doesn't go to school in Texas, but that's the plan we're under and you know, it's just the way it works. Um, tax planning strategies. Long-term capital gains, the sale of a home, you do have a good deal there. We'll talk more about that in home ownership, but that is one of the um, certainly good deals from, from, now there's limits on this. You can't be flipping houses and have it be tax-free all the time. You gotta live in it, and you also, uh, uh, there's limits on, on how much uh, it can be. The other thing about these too is that interest uh, deduction, that property tax interest, that applies to your primary and your secondary home. So you can have a vacation home. You know, if you want to decide, well, we're, we're getting clobbered here on taxes, um, I want a, you know, investment home, and I'm going to go ahead and pay interest on that, that interest will be uh, um, deductible. Self-employment taxes. Self-employment is, is a, obviously, you have a lot more opportunities. If you work for the government um, or you work for, you know, a, a public agency, you, you can't, you know, very well have the same write-offs as somebody, say, in real estate who has vehicles and other things. So it's a lot more interesting for them. Uh, children's investments and income shifting, yeah, they got to be less than, than 1500 bucks for the, for the child. But again, this would fall in these uh, 129s. And then the education IRA savings, um, like I say, many times the earnings are, are tax-free, and that applies to the 529s. They don't specifically say 529 in here, but um, there's lots of information in there. Okay, I don't want to check that. Um, retirement plan, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, and Keo. So traditional IRA, there's income limits in it. Probably won't qualify that for very long. Then you have the Roth IRA and then the Keo, which is for um, self-employed folks. Then there's a number of, just about everybody, private sector, it can be 401k, um, 401b, primary for education, and thrift savings plan, TSP. If you're in the military, you, you know a little bit more about that. But these are all tax-deferred vehicles. And then Social Security, what, I, what I'm saying there is it's insolvent under its current scheme. If you think, oh, I don't need to save for retirement, I'm going to have Social Security, may or may not. Um, probably for most of us, we won't ever get Social Security. And that's for two reasons. It's going to probably be restructured, so maybe it will survive. But also, in whatever forward planning, it's going to be means-tested. So if you have other income, if you have, you know, money set aside from, from other sources, uh, you're not going to get that money back. It's, it's just not the way it is. It's, uh, when they say means tested, that means if you've got a certain amount of income, um, that, that money's going to be, because the plan is, is, um, hasn't been properly supported, um, you're not going to get the Social Security money. So what I'm saying is you... you have to be more self-reliant than than people were in the past. And that next bullet about there's a definite move away from pension plans. Um, you know that you see even this week companies are are stepping back. In fact, uh, I believe it's IBM. And there's a couple others just this week said that they're going to give um, you know folks a, a cash amount for for medical now rather than a medical plan. And you see pension plans, the actual pensions. Uh, very few companies are offering the pension plan. They're offering investments in 401ks and the other things to um, have people set it up for themselves. So, you know, when you're setting it up for yourselves, and that's what I mean by the opportunity for the smart, you know, if you know what you're doing, if you're organized and you do well, uh, you're going to be better off than, than under, you know, some directed pension plan. But if you're not good with it, if you, you know, either don't invest or whatever, it's it's going to be a penalty for the stupid. So if, if you're if you're not sharp, uh, man, life's just going to get harder because it's it's you know the old days of, of everybody being on a pension. Um, 
that's something that they've gotten away from. This is the homework. I tried to put a little more detail in here in terms of the homework, uh, just because you know different people, have different versions of books. So these are the uh, the problems. Questions? Anybody got any uh, other questions? I'm going to do this session. This actually seemed to work pretty well tonight. Um, I'm going to do um, office hour on um, on Thursday night. So if you do have specific questions that you think I kind of tapped ants around or didn't give you the answer you wanted. Um, if you could put it in an email and send it to me pretty quick, you know, next day or, well, obviously uh, sometime tomorrow, if not this evening, then we can talk about it on Thursday and I can explain it a little bit better because I'm not going to have, you know, a formal uh, type type slides or any of that kind of stuff on, on uh, Thursday other than to just explain uh, the same questions. What time Thursday? It is going to be 5.30, so just like tonight. I, I, I'm not trying to give anybody a bad time, but yeah, I think I put it all in the announcements. So if, if, if I'm, you know, if I see something's on Blackboard and you aren't seeing it on Blackboard, then, then let me know. But I think in the announcement for this one, I put it up for, for Thursday. And uh, Thursday at 5.30. So, all right. Um, yeah, but, yeah, I don't want to, you know, beat a dead horse here, but you know, the, the takeaways from this are if you're waiting to April 15th to figure out what your tax situation is, um, you know, that's not the way to do it. That's not a plan. That's that's more of a, a mystery. And if you do it before the end of the year, um, you can see your situation developing. And if it looks like you're going to be getting clobbered by taxes and, and you don't think it's right, um, you know, that would be the time to do the research yourself or contact an accountant and say, this is, you know, what can I do? Um, in terms of homework, I'm, people are still having book issues. I've, you know, my, my intent with the homework is I don't want, you know, everybody to be, you know, in addition to preparing for your finals and stuff, to be trying to get all the homework done at the end. But I've, I'm um, taking the date restrictions off of, of the homework turn-ins. So you get, you know, the, the only limitations on the, uh, on the homework turn-in session are that, you know, you can just turn it in once, but in terms of a due date and being graded late, that's not happening, at least for another few weeks. I've asked some people to, uh, you know, let me know when they finally get their books, and until everybody's got a book, um, yeah, I don't want to penalize anybody. Other questions? All righty then. Well, till Thursday then, and, and again, none of these things are mandatory. Um, you know, I'll always put it out on YouTube and gives you the opportunity to fast forward through it and you know, do whatever you like. But uh, I think uh, some of these things today, some of the things in the book were uh, whatever, not as thorough as they could be in terms of, of how to, to actually go about the method of trying to plan out your taxes. All right, talk to you Thursday then.